thank you very much, uh, and thank you uh, to the organizing committee, the scientific committee, uh, for inviting me here. I love coming to Croatia. I've been here many times, um, and it's particularly meaningful for me because when I became a convert to endocrinology from cardiology, uh, my first paper that I ever gave at a scientific meeting, uh, I won't tell you how long ago it was, but it was uh, a very long time ago, was in Zagreb, um, I think about 40 years ago. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, my talk is going to be very simple today. Um, I'm not going to use the word gene at all, which is uh, probably somewhat embarrassing for some people. Um, but I have got some simple but important messages at the end. So this slide simply indicates my affiliations, and I don't believe I've got any conflicts with regard to what I'm going to be talking about today. So the po possibility that oats be uh, a part of the diabetic dietary prescription is certainly not new. Um, this is the major uh, introduction to diabetic diets in the last century in Britain, uh, the Lawrence Line diet. And the Lawrence Line diet uh, actually suggested that oats, or rather oatmeal, uh, as you can see here, was one of the carbohydrates which was actually permitted in the diabetic diet of those times. So it's nothing new. And when we did our early studies of high-fiber diets in Oxford in the 1970s and 1980s, the first controlled studies of high-fiber diets uh, used in the long term, uh, oats were a part of our high-fiber diets, but we certainly didn't uh, single out oats. They were just there in the background. So not um, a novel idea, but um, something which has become much more interesting recently. Now, um, Simon has talked mainly about the epidemiology, or the, he's alluded to the clinical trials, and there is no doubt in my mind that um, the use of oats in the long term certainly can improve glycemic control. Rather than spend uh, too much time, although I shall allude to them later on, uh, with meta-analyses, um, I really want to just show you one example, which I think is uh, probably, uh, in my opinion, the best of the recent studies uh, from China, published just a couple of years ago in Nutrients, looking at the long-term effects of whole grain oats on uh, glycemic control and other measures, but I'm only talking about glycemic control. It was uh, really a very remarkable study. Um, I don't think many studies of this kind have been done, where something like 450 people with type 2 were randomized. This particular paper deals with those who were defined according to Chinese criteria as being overweight, that is a BMI greater than 24. And they were randomized, as you can see, into those four groups here, a sort of the usual care group, a group described as the diet group, and I'll define these different groups in a moment, but people that were not specifically given oats, and a couple of groups that were given oats. Uh, as can only be done in some countries, uh, these people were housed in a hotel for a month. They were given uh, all their food, and they were given intensive training. And uh, believe me, if you know the way these studies are done in China, intensive training is intensive training. Uh, I'm enormously respectful and envious of this kind of research. And they were then followed up for a year uh, when they were sent home. Um, and during that year, although the, the diet was meant to be uh, ad lib, it was not specifically a weight loss diet, uh, they were given further training and they were provided uh, with the foods. So this was really the interventions here, the nutritional interventions. Uh, the usual care was a sort of middle-of-the-road fiber diet, uh, average carbohydrate and fat. But the three diets that are of interest is the healthy diet, which was a moderately increased fiber diet, relatively high in carbohydrate, as you can see. Uh, the oats diets were similar with regard to macronutrient composition, but of course contained 50 or 100 grams of oats, uh, which provided a certain amount of beta-glucans. Now, this was no additional beta-glucans. This was just the beta-glucans in the oats. Uh, 
Now, the results, if you've read the paper, and I'm sure some of you will have read the paper, are presented in a rather complicated way, and this is sort of my simplified version of the results. But they're very uh, interestingly presented and analyzed because, um, first of all, there was a comparison uh, at one month and one year um, between the usual diet and the healthy diet. And so uh, the figures here for the healthy diet, these changes here for the healthy diet represent the changes compared with usual care. So the healthy diet gave modest but meaningful reductions in body weight. Remember, it wasn't a weight-reducing diet. Um, and reductions, significant reductions in fasting glucose, postprandial glucose, and a modest again but meaningful reduction in hemoglobin A1c. When you look at what was achieved by the 50 and 100 grams of oats, the comparisons now are with the healthy diet. So anything you see here in the changes column is additional benefit. And just to summarize, um, really the 50 grams of oats, remember that the macronutrient composition was not vastly different, the 50 grams of oats really didn't achieve much more, a little bit more, but the, the little was not really statistically significant uh, than the healthy diet. The 100 grams of oats, on the other hand, after a year, produced uh, not a huge further benefit, but a modest further benefit, which was in fact uh, statistically significant. So I think really a very interesting study. Most of the other studies that have been done have really been oats versus controls. But this one takes it one step further, and that is what is special about oats compared with other so-called uh, healthy approaches. The healthy diet would have been very compatible with our now antique but still probably sensible recommendations going back to 2004. Uh, an embarrassment that we have recommendations that go back to 2004. Hopefully we'll, rec we'll rectify that soon. So the assumption is, uh, sorry, I went rather quickly through that one. The um, assumption is that the benefits of oats is due to beta-glucans, and I'm going to come back to the beta-glucan story in a moment, but let's just stick with oats for now. Um, of course, the oats that I mentioned in the previous study were whole grain oats, that is the old-fashioned sort of rolled oats that you see here. But as everybody here knows, uh, in terms of structure, there are very different preparations available. And one of the points that I want to make, just to make it now, is that I think some of the epidemiology is to, uh, confounded by the fact that when we talk about oats in the epidemiological context, we have no idea whether people are talking about this lot of oats or this lot of oats. And um, this is going to be one of my messages, so we'll come back to that shortly. So what happens if we look at these oats which have been subjected to different degrees of processing? Um, somebody called uh, Tosh, whom I don't know, may be known to people here, indeed may be in the audience here, um, has attempted a review of the human studies investigating postprandial blood glucose, lev lowering ability, of oats and barley food, uh, not specifically in relation to processing, but I want to particularly point out the component of this paper, which does look at the processing. It's a fairly lengthy and, and good paper published in the EJCN. This particular aspect of the paper looks at the uh, change in the area under the curve. These are acute studies now. The change in the area under the curve in relation to the ratio of beta-glucans uh, and um, uh, available carbohydrate or in relation to uh, beta-glucan dose. And we'll just stick with a bottom curve there, uh, the beta-glucan dose, because I think this is uh, actually more striking. And the, the uh, study is divided up into those that used, the studies that used processed grain, uh, uh, particularly, and those that used uh, the relatively unprocessed intact grain, and uh, most of them were, were, were oats. And what you can see here certainly is that the more uh, beta-glucan that the oats contained, uh, the more the reduction was in area under the curve. 
But of particular interest to the point that I'm making, the studies that used whole grain as distinct from um, the processed grains uh, had a much greater effect in terms of reducing area under the curve. Uh, Tosh and a colleague uh, published in the British Journal of Nutrition a further systematic review um, uh, a couple of years later, uh, which uh, gave some very simple results, uh, but I think important, looking particularly at glycemic index. And here, of course, uh, these uh, glycemic index data represent different studies rather than individuals. And it is very clear that the uh, rolled oats, the whole grain oats, uh, the muesli, which include whole grain oats, had an appreciably lower glycemic index than did the more processed whole grains. So the story um, sort of progresses from there. So we'll just leave processing for the moment and move on to uh, beta-glucans. So that's the story of oats. What is the story of beta-glucans? Well, the story of beta-glucans is uh, one which has principally concentrated on acute effects. And this, I think, is one of the earlier studies by Brighton, where they did, it sounds absolutely ghastly experiment, I'm glad I didn't participate in it, where they looked at the effect of guar gum and oat gum on uh, blood glucose responses postprandially. And the, um, the guar gum and um, the oat gum were turned into a pudding. They describe it as a pudding with glucose and had to be consumed. Um, leaving aside the, uh, the culinary effects of this particular project, I mean, you can see that both the uh, guar gum, it doesn't matter which is which, but both the guar gum and the uh, oat gum uh, reduced the postprandial response. Uh, there are uh, numerous studies of this kind. I just really showed two as examples. Here's one by Luke Tappy, um, which was looking at, uh, and this was in type 2 diabetes. The Brighton one was in healthy individuals. Uh, this one in type 2 diabetes looked at a continental breakfast. Uh, the, um, the gum or the, the beta-glucan was in the cereal, and looking at cereals with 4 grams, 6 grams, and and eight grams of beta-glucan, and you can see very clearly here that the postprandial glucose, the area under the curve, was appreciably reduced uh, with beta-glucan addition, particularly when it got over four grams. Um, the uh, last one, just to mention, Alexandra and David Jenkins and Vlad, I think, were all authors of this particular paper, which looked at um, uh, uh, two functional foods, uh, the, um, a, a special cereal, a prototype cereal, something described as a prototype cereal here, which had eight grams of um, uh, beta-glucans, a prototype bar, which had um, six grams of uh, beta-glucan. I think the cereal, the oat brand cereal, uh, had four grams of beta-glucan, and you can see that certainly the two uh, functional foods substantially reduced the glycemic response. So no question whatsoever that the addition of beta-glucan in an acute situation to a carbohydrate-containing food uh, or meal uh, reduces postprandial glycemia. There is a meta-analysis, and again, I don't know uh, doctors Tawari and Cummins personally, um, which looked at this question um, uh, in a so-called meta-analysis and came to the conclusion that three grams a day of oat or barley beta-glucans is sufficient to decrease cholesterol, and someone else is going to be talking about lipids, so I'm not allowed to mention that. Uh, but the effect on blood glucose is inconclusive with great heterogeneity. I think that I'm not going to critique this meta-analysis in any detail, but I think it actually uh, disobeys the first law of meta-analyses, which is that meta-analyses should really compare like studies. And in fact, these were not really like studies. They were a hodgepodge of studies and um, I, I think are not interpretable. But in fact, uh, the conclusion may be correct that three grams of uh, beta-glucans per day is not enough. So the conclusion may well be uh, correct. Uh, that's the cholesterol story. So I won't mention that. So what is the evidence that beta-glucans in the long term can influence uh, the glycemic uh, response? Well, there's actually, at least as far as I can find out, very little information about long-term beta-glucans uh, 
uh, addition uh, to foods. This was one of the first ones called a pilot study where um, oat bran concentrate bread products or alternatives, it included muffins and various other things, uh, were looked at in uh, a very small group of people, eight people in fact, in a 12-week crossover study. So it was 12 weeks on white bread and 12 weeks on oat bran uh, concentrate uh, products. And uh, it really looked as if there was a substantial uh, difference in um, uh, glycemic response. Uh, perhaps just have a, sorry, I, uh, perhaps just have a look here at the uh, total area under the glu eight hour glucose curve. Uh, quite a substantial difference. But this particular study involved a fairly large amount of beta glucans. I think it was about 16 grams a day total. So uh, it was very encouraging. But in fact, the subsequent studies that uh, we were able to, to identify, um, this one particularly done on uh, people with raised blood pressure, were really not that encouraging. Uh, this one involved, I can never remember just how much each of these involves, this one involved about eight grams of beta-glucans a day in uh, various uh, foods, and um, on average, and you can see, although the summary of this paper claims that there were benefits on carbohydrate metabolism, you can see if you look at glucose increment over their 12-week period that the um, postprandial glucose uh, seems hardly to have changed here. It seems to have got worse in the control group. Um, but we're not sure just what happened to their overall caloric intake in this uh, 12 weeks. This was also in people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and the only significant change was the fact that the insulin increment seems to have reduced more on the beta-glucan diet than the control diet. But frankly, if you have a look at the results, at least as far as carbohydrates and metabolism is concerned, I don't think you'll find it very impressive. And then if you just want a little bit more damnation in terms of uh, the effect of long-term beta-glucan addition, uh, this one, which the, the final one, um, which we came up with, which was a controlled study of beta-glucan enriched soup, admittedly not with a big total daily dose of beta-glucan, I think it was on average uh, just under four grams a day, showed no difference uh, over a two-month follow-up period. Now, I suppose it's conceivable that we may have missed some studies, but these were all the studies we could come up with. So the point that I wish to make about beta-glucans is, although there is no doubt that there has been an impressive effect demonstrated by members of this study group and others, when beta-glucan is added to a carbohydrate-containing food, we are a bit short in terms of long-term data. We found a, um, another meta-analysis, uh, very excited because thought that this was going to solve the whole problem, uh, particularly in view of um, uh, the two different settings that I've given you. The one, the effect of oats, which I've suggested is strong in the long term, to the effect of beta-glucans, which I su suggested is not strong in the long term. And this particular study uh, came up with a conclusion that a higher consumption of whole oats and oat bran, but not beta-glucans extract uh, from either oat or barley, is associated with a long-term improvement in fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1c, and insulin in type 2 diabetes. So the conclusion seemed to go very much with the point that I've been trying to make. But I would have to say, and again, it would be interesting to hear from others who try to evaluate uh, this particular uh, uh, meta-analysis, published in, I would have to say, uh, a journal that I'd never heard of before, but that's probably just reflecting my own ignorance. Uh, I found the meta-analysis to be uninterpretable, again, because studies were lumped together that seemed to bear little relationship to each other. But others may wish to comment on that. So... Um, Finally, um, how did we put all this together? Well, um, found a very nice paper in the British Journal of Nutrition by Wang and Ellis. That's Peter Ellis, who will be known to, to uh, a number of people in this room. And I think may have come to some of, no, not may, did come to some of our earlier meetings uh, of this group a long time ago. And they looked at some of the um, explanations behind what was going on uh, with the sort of story that I've just been telling you.
And um, they in particular looked at the effect of uh, food structure. This is a stained version of looking at what happens to the beta-glucan when you look at a fairly uh, intact grain, uh, a processed grain, and then a very highly processed grain down here. And this was not an intervention study in any way. It simply looked at the uh, mechanistic aspects uh, for which information was available. And they came up with a uh, complicated series of uh, conclusions, but really pointed out that uh, they felt the ability of oat bran to increase uh, viscosity of digestion in the GIT is a major determinant of its potential to influence uh, lipids as well as blood glucose. And was suggesting that one needed to take into account chemical structure, molecular weight, and this whole range of uh, physicochemical properties of bran which could explain uh, what was going on. There were species differences, uh, different varieties, growing and storage conditions, uh, as well as food preparation uh, and storage could all affect these physicochemical uh, situations and were, I think, probably uh, a major reason behind these different effects uh, that uh, have been observed and that I've talked about. So, in conclusion, and um, uh, I think keeping well within my time limits, uh, what do I conclude? Well, I've offered you some conclusions as we've gone along, but in summary, I believe there is good evidence that a diet rich in whole grain oats can improve glycemic control when compared with a control diet. I think the improvement uh, is um, fairly modest, probably, with regard to what can be achieved uh, by a so-called healthy diet, the kind of diet that we've recommended uh, for a long time, and that probably to achieve that benefit, that additional benefit, one needs to have a fairly substantial amount of whole grain oats. I've mentioned several times um, the, the fact that uh, not suggesting that beta-glucans is not a useful long-term uh, uh, pr process to improve glycemic control, but the evidence is not there, uh, in my opinion, uh, from long-term trials. So if anybody wishes to be recommending the addition of beta-glucans, I think uh, it would not be justified to do that without more long-term data. And then I think particularly important is this question of processing of oats, um, food preparation and storage, as suggested by Pete Ellison and colleagues, um, are really incredibly important and have probably been major reasons why the epidemiology has come up with less than consistent results. So um, I guess... My absolute bottom line is it's terribly fashionable now to be looking to ha for personalized medicine for everything we're doing, for looking at uh, different approaches in people with different genetic makeups. But if we want to do this with regard to oats and probably dietary fiber in general, it is of equal importance to understand the variation of the food product as much as it is to understand the variation of the individual. So... There I rest my case, and I'm aware that I have gone on for 21 minutes. I apologize for one minute over time.